All right, guys, welcome back to PacWest Bigfoot. This is David, and welcome to this week's encounter story. Um, real quick, uh, you can stop on by mypacwestbigfoot.com to get your PacWest Bigfoot t-shirts and hats and or coffee mugs that you guys have been asking for. Also, just to let you know, <clears throat> you can go to PacWestBigfoot.com. You can sign up to the clan today and uh, get in there to win uh, the free giveaway for August, which is going to be a Southern California uh, Sasquatch Organization uh, t-shirt. It's a team member t-shirt, plus I've got some awesome little, uh, they're little uh, like greeting cards almost, um, blank cards there that have some awesome, awesome hand artwork from Robin. Uh, I believe it's Robin Hyatt, and I'll be sharing her uh, uh, link out this Friday uh, just to show you guys uh, what a wonderful artist she is and what kind of stuff she does around the the Bigfoot community. So it's pretty awesome, great artist. So there you have it. So <clears throat> let me uh, clear my throat. <clears throat> All right, and let's get in to this week's encounter story: missing man taken by Bigfoot in Oregon. This encounter story was inspired by my friend Ori and his friend's chilling discovery. Missing man taken by Bigfoot in Oregon. Sounds like what they call clickbait today. But what I'm about to share with you, Dave, is what I know to be true. Because I was the one who came upon the scene. I once sat in the meeting of finding Bigfoot in a town hall. I was, uh, I said my piece, and that was it. I do not believe they wanted to get out there on a 411 Bigfoot report, and personally, I do not believe a couple of them believed these things are dangerous. But they are. And here's what I found that day, and what is just another missing person in the vast wilderness of the Pacific Northwest that goes uninvestigated and without real care by any official agencies. Here's what happened. Taken by Bigfoot. My name is Jared, a friend of mine, a friend who spent his free time enjoying the outdoors searching for evidence of something that I first uh, did not believe in. Well, he went missing a while back in the mountains of Oregon. Personally, I thought it was kind of weird. Instead of hunting deer or fishing, my best friend loved hiking around searching for what I believed to be a myth until now. Of course, many people go missing in the forests of America every year, and for the most part, you hear very little of it. You simply see the posters on, on telephone poles and cork boards in your local grocery store. But I am not going to get into the politics and bashing of agencies for not giving us the full story of these things. I am simply going to tell you what I know. And that is it. I have scoured the whole area my buddy went missing in. I know it pretty well. Well, all but a certain mountain we decided to leave alone due to the fact it was hard to get to and up. There was an old logging road up there, but even today you could only get through with a motorbike or on foot, if you ask me. But not my friend. He made it one day with his little truck, apparently. And, unfortunately, the day before that was the last day I would ever see him again. Three Links Between Three Links and Ripple Brook are some pretty lofty mountains, and all, and all have rough, rugged, old logging roads that, for the most part, have been all but abandoned. People do run up through there with dirt bikes, four-wheelers, and such constantly, but there are still some sections that are just too far up and out of the way to travel. Simply put, they are old, dark, and lonely, overgrown roads so far out to care about or venture to. This is why my friend loved it so much. It was out of sight of people, well, other than him and a couple other guys who knew about these off-the-beaten-path roads and such. To him, this was prime Bigfoot and country, he would say. Looking back today with all the stories I have heard thus far about this part of Oregon and its history with this animal, I see now it is most likely true. Bigfoot does exist, and they can be dangerous. Very dangerous. They are also extremely intelligent, seeing how they can just take someone in the middle of the day or night and leave almost no evidence they were even there. My friend did have some great evidence recently before he disappeared he had shown and shared with me. It was collected about five to seven miles away from where he went missing. 
the most compelling was a picture of a footprint in a vocal recording that even sent chills up my spine. I knew it was not faked. It sounded real, and trust me, I spent a lot of time out in the woods, and I never heard anything like that before. There were also some tree knocks on that same recording. Apparently, it was all collected on the same weekend out searching. I'm still trying to get a copy of everything from his wife and kids, but they are still not speaking to anyone, not even me. So let me tell you exactly what I found and what I think happened. <coughs> Bigfoot took my friend. My buddy owns a small old Toyota pickup, something from the 1980s, I believe. <coughs> he fixed it up, jacked it up, and made a pretty awesome four-wheel drive out of the thing, to tell you the truth. He used it to get up and out as far as he could, even to some places where otherwise he could have been fined for driving into, I'm sure. Heck, I was with him many times in that thing, and we were not to be... <laughs> we were in that thing where we were not to be in the first place. Anyways... <clears throat> of the few times I went with him on this crazy Bigfooting adventures. I never heard or noticed a thing, but then again, I only went on those adventures a few times. Most of the time, we hunted or fished together only. I was not really into the Bigfoot thing. Basically, he would travel up and into a particular area he would choose with care on a Friday evening, set up a small camp, and then get going with the research, collecting evidence and tracking uh, for the rest of the weekend. Of course, he was always armed, a small handgun. He always carried his cell phone, but out there, well, it was only good for picture taking. He also left behind his location to his family, just in case, and that is why I did not have to go looking all over the world for him when he did not come back one Sunday evening. My friend was a cautious fellow. He never did anything that would put himself or others for that matter in harm's way other than the big footing he would do well he was not even close to as reckless as i have been in my own life he was not a drinker smoker and detested drugs of any kind he was a good friend albeit weird to a point <coughs> he was a true believer in the existence of bigfoot since an early age personally and he told me the story more times than i can count but he had a visual with his father once while out fishing the upper, or lower if you look on a map, Clackamas River. <coughs> Bigfoot and the Kid. I won't go into a ton of detail, but the counter encounter was pretty convincing, and especially when his dad told me the same thing before he passed away over a decade ago. They were fly fishing. Well, he was teaching my friend, his son, to fly fish. On one side of the river, where they were at, had a large open area right in the middle of the hillside. They had been there since early afternoon, and it was approaching dusk when they, well, my friend noticed something moving quickly across the open area. He pointed to show his dad. As they both watched it clear the crossing in what seemed record time for a human being, it stopped, turned towards them, and screamed the most awful gut-wrenching scream they'd ever heard. <clears throat> well... My buddy said he heard that scream several times in his life, once while out bigfooting and the other one on a recording device he would leave out one night and retrieve the next day, the one I heard. <clears throat> they were both very adamant about what they heard and from what it came from, very adamant. Anyways, it walked off into the tree line to the east of the open area, and that is when his dad said they should go, so they left immediately for home. They only shared it with his sister and his mother until he got older. Then he shared it with me and some other friends. Well, those that believed in this thing and joined him on the searches. Today I am a believer, for good reason, because I found the evidence, and it was ignored. Meanwhile, back in the Oregon woods. Like I said above, my buddy loved to spend time researching, and once in a while, against my better judgment, he would go alone when nobody was available, and he was desperate to get outdoors. This one time he did, and now he is gone. Here is how it went down and what I found. He headed up to the area I mentioned him before. This time, however, he went even further to the top of the mountains between Three Links and Ripplebrook, Oregon. He left late Friday afternoon after work. His wife did mention he left a few hours before dark, so he uh, knew he could make it to where he wanted just before dark to set up camp. 
He also gave her permission to tell me where he was exactly, just in case I changed my mind about the offer to go up he made the week before. I did change my mind for a few, but as I started to pack Saturday morning, my girlfriend said she wanted to head to the city for the day and wanted me to go, so I did that instead. And besides, I think it was too late even by then to have helped, even if I could have to begin with. It was not until Sunday evening, well, late afternoon around 4 or 5 p.m., that my buddy's wife called me a little frantic. Usually once he gets down off a mountain or out of an area where he he gets a signal, he will call her to tell her he is fine and heading back. He never called, at least not by that point, and that was the worry point. She was frantic, but not out of her wits by any means. This was not the first time he was late, really, really late for that matter. But he was late nonetheless, and someone had to go look for him. And that would be me. And of course, I volunteered. He was my good friend, after all. I left immediately, taking only some water and a light snack. I figured I'm, he might just have car trouble, nothing serious. It took me a while to get up there, at least to the cutoff where I thought I would eventually run into him. Funny, I had not seen him yet, not even walking down to the main highway to get a better reception to check in at least. It was a winding old road and cutbacks galore, and eventually my old, big old SUV would not go any further. I decided to get out and walk the rest of the way. I had been up this way once. There was only about, I don't know, one to one and a half miles left to the end of it. Well, somewhat the end. I had to walk the rest to find him. Knock, knock. Anybody home? The little truck that could was there, just at the end of the old dirt logging road that was, well, not really dirt anymore as much it was overgrown grass with recent vehicle tracks running between and under the tree limbs that hung low over it. It was like a green tunnel with little light at the end. But at the end it came to a large open area from which you could see the mountains beyond and then straight ahead more old overgreen road. Well, trail more like it. The road was gone from that point on. I cannot see him anywhere just both doors open to the truck, but nobody could be seen. The camping gear, gear, well, food, tent, and everything else was still in the pa back of the truck, as if he either just packed it up or decided to hang out and decided to hang out a little longer, or it was never unpacked in the first place. It was the latter that I had come to find to be the right answer, and the thought that sent shivers up my spine. It was all so odd. Nothing around the place looked camped in at all, not even a fire pit. I started calling his name as loud as I could. Nothing. I tried again and again, but nothing. No answer. Other than birds and some irritated chipmunks nearby could be heard. <coughs> I decided it was early in the day that maybe he walked off and got himself into a little bind, possibly hurt himself. So I decided to head down the road that was now a small, overgrown trail to see if he might just be in a bit of that trouble or can't simply hear me. <clears throat> I called out his name every minute or so as I walked on. It was about 50 to 60 yards down the trail when I spotted impressions on the ground, several actually, as they stopped and started up again. They looked like drag marks. It was not until I started getting into the damper, taller grass that I noticed footprint shape impressions. You could just tell that someone had been here, walking. I thought for a second I was on the right path for finding my friend, but <clears throat> with further examination, the stride seemed rather long for a person. My buddy was not Will Chamberlain, that was for sure, I remember thinking. Looking at the footprint impressions, I noticed they were just to the left of the drag marks. Something dragged something else off down this trail, and following them further, it veered off into the forest to the north. My heart started beating faster as I followed the tracks and sign along. Eventually I found myself in the thick of trees and low-lying bush. What I found next was weird, but I knew it, what it was. Warning signs. X marks the spot. Bigfoot make large X-shaped structures out of trees and from what I can tell, they are usually older, almost dead trees. Just an interesting side note for you researchers out there. I've never seen anything like it, 
but there were two distinct X-shaped structures within yards of each other, and that is where the drag marks ended in the impressions and the impressions on the ground. The forest floor became harder, covered with pine needle, dry pine needle, so tracks were not going to be found from that point on anyways. My friend found Bigfoot. There was no other answer, if you know the sign. Hanging out with him on many of his searches, well, footprints or impressions that large and spread apart could only be from something bipedal and large. I, uh, I, retra I retraced everything from the camp and back again. It was no cougar and absolutely not a black bear. I am a hunter. I know track. This was either a very large person or Bigfoot, a real live and dangerous Bigfoot that took my friend dragging him off into the woods. This is not unheard of, and today I listen to 411 more than I watch Finding Bigfoot. Hey, it took my friend. They care, but they can't. I'm not going to blame people for seeming to be uncaring. They care, I believe, but the Forest Service and other state services and federal services simply can't do anything about it. Why? I have no idea. Just a bunch of hypotheses. My friend was taken by Bigfoot. The footprints and impressions stated that fact. And the boundary or warning signs in the forest were not man-made, but were made by something with arms, hands, and some great intelligence. He never made it to the first night. That is at least something I got from the officials that did a somewhat short investigation before it was taken over by the federal government. And strange as it sounds, it was the EPA that took over. He was only there for about an hour or two, at most, before they say he walked off into the woods himself, which he did not. They know the drag marks were drag marks, and that the impressions that I swear were footprints were in fact footprints from a larger, bipedal person or animal. While the officials are not saying a thing, because I believe they cannot, there was one official who said to not go back up there ever as it was dangerous. That was all he said to me. I believe these things are dangerous. I believe they are wild animals, and I believe, believe they should be avoided. My friend is a testimony to that today. Thanks.